Hi, I'm Natalie Emmanuel. In this episode, we travel to the rugged Caucasus region where Asia meets Europe. Queen Tamar led the Kingdom of Georgia at a time when men, not women, were born to rule. She drove medieval armies to victory, inspired soldiers with her piety and wisdom, and stood up to the most annoying ex-husband in history. (laughs) She secured her frontiers and ushered her mountain kingdom into a golden age of prosperity, art, literature, and wonderful red wine. Here to tell the story of Queen Tamar, ruler of Georgia, is our daughter-father history team of Emily and John Gordon. Thanks, Natalie, and welcome back to the world's hip-hop recording capital in Atlanta, Georgia. I guess you're going to be spending some time around Atlanta these days filming a project with one of the world's most legendary directors. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. But the Georgia we're talking about today is about 10,000 kilometers from Trilith Studios (laughs) and a thousand years from our time in history. Emily, what made you want to write a book chapter on Queen Tamar? Well, Natalie, Tamar lived in a time where women weren't supposed to rule. But unlike many of the women who became reigning monarchs, Tamar had a father who was far-sighted enough to make her transition to power easier by appointing her his heir before he died. And apart from Rhaenyra Targaryen on House of the Dragon, not many women had this advantage before they took power. I guess that's one thing I think I really like about her story, that there's this wonderful family connection different from most other war queens. And it's an advantage that not many had. So why don't you tell us about Rhaenyra, I mean uh, Tamar, and the kingdom she ruled? Sure. Uh, But before we start, I want to guarantee to our listeners that I will be approaching all of these very difficult pronunciations with an authentic Georgian accent. And by authentic, I mean Atlanta, Georgia, home of the peach, the walking dead, and Coca-Cola. So to set the scene a little bit, we're in the kingdom of Georgia. At the time, it was sandwiched between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. To the south of Georgia was Azerbaijan, Armenia, and several Muslim emirates that were controlled by sultans at the time. To the north, we have Ossetia and Kievan Rus. So, Tamar was known as someone with these beautiful, deep, dark eyes. She had rosy cheeks and a melodic, cheerful voice, which would serve her well later on. She was known for amazing and powerful religious speeches. And I think Tamar was born somewhere in, what, the late uh, 1100s, something like that. So we're talking serious medieval time. Yeah, she was born in 1160. The medieval chroniclers refer to her as fortunate, God-fearing, beautiful, and good-natured, a lover of churches, monks, and nuns. She would give alms to the poor and helped those looking for justice, and that she would throughout her life. So pretty pious. I mean, now we're talking the Caucasus Mountains, basically, the mm-hmm. Caucasian region, and that area is what, Eastern Orthodox at this point? Yes, exactly. So a lot of her life would be influenced by the Orthodox Church, as we'll come to see. At 18 years old in 1178, she began her leadership and was crowned as co-ruler by her father, King Georgi III. She would be his sovereign co-ruler with him, which is uh, an interesting situation because we don't see a lot of war queens throughout our book that get to be co-rulers alongside their parents. We see in Dara Gandhi who learned from her parents, but it, it was, I think, really cool to see a father acknowledging his daughter's ability to rule and saying, let's do this together. But part of it though is he knew that he wasn't gonna live forever. Mm-hmm. And when he died, there oftentimes are succession crises because if there's a man to step in, nobody thinks twice about it. But if there's only a woman left, sometimes there's trouble, right? For sure. And uh, he was known as someone who didn't just value nepotism like I'd say most uh, rulers did throughout you know, history, throughout our book. Uh, he was known for someone who wanted to reward loyalty and hard work, and he saw those qualities in Tamar. He was also known as someone who was very harsh with his punishments, from gouging eyes out of, of people who didn't perform well or, or from criminals. Chopping off body parts. Yeah. You can guess which ones. <laughs> yeah, disembowelment as well. But he kind of took her under his wing, and uh, they served together for about six years until his death. The courts in the Orthodox Church at the time of his death knew that this was a great opportunity to step in and influence Tamar while she's kind of scrambling on her own during this time of transition. 
we like to refer to them, I think, in the book as the wolves kind of preying on her, saying, oh, here's a weak woman. She's merciful. She's really just a rallying figurehead. Let's step in and um, take some influence while we can. And, and you find that there, there are always nobles who want to step up and become the power behind the throne and use the woman as the pretty face. In the War of the Roses, you had a lot of that with uh, Marguerite d'Anjou. You find that in a number of succession crises. Ancient Egypt had them plenty of times. For sure. And they were pushing Tamar to support the largest political faction at the time, the Esnarni. They made several demands of her. First, that she would have a coronation ceremony that was dictated by the nobility. And the significance of that is that Tamar was not allowed to have power and influence unless it was under the dictation and control of the courts of those wolves we mentioned before. So that was kind of a manipulation technique, saying you are not legitimate unless we say so. Next, they wanted to strip the royal chancellor that her father had appointed of all of his titles and powers in order to diminish that very legacy that Tamar was trying to support. Third, as many times we see throughout history, they thought it was a little weird that a woman is unmarried at this point, and of course, the, the old age of 18, so. Yeah, she needs a man to make an honest woman out of her. Oh, of course, of course. So they thought the best match for her would be a warlord from Russia who was living along the border named Yuri Bogolubsky. They were hoping that some of the border conflicts would subside with this marriage um, and, and kind of help them focus on the South. And uh, we see a lot of this marriage that was to come um, chronicled in the history and eulogy of kings is the source we read from a lot. So Yuri is this guy from Russia. And, you know, some people are kind of rough in that area. Some people are nice and gallant and gentlemanly. Where did Yuri fall on the uh, most eligible bachelor list? He definitely wasn't the best. He was known, you know, we, we get a couple of these these bad husbands throughout our book, um, known as someone who was a drinker, known as someone who's more brutish and harsh and, and definitely captivated with revenge throughout his life, as we'll come to see. Yeah, and, and harsh is by the standards of the time. So they back then they didn't say, I'm going to go medieval on you. They just said, I'm going to do what I do on you. And, and Yuri was one of those kind of guys who I gather... Uh, from what we read, tended to get into fights, tended to get drunk, tended to knife people. Mm -hmm. I mean, just not somebody who, who was very good for the court or very good for Tamar as a husband. Exactly. And, and how they would kind of keep that in check because they did not want Tamar in charge. They don't want someone outside of their courts um, in charge either. And so Yuri was crowned the Mepe or the King of Georgia. But because she was native to the region, she got to maintain a higher status and was called the Queen of Queens, the King of Kings, and got to obtain that higher title. Yeah, I think that's like Cleopatra had that title of Queen of Kings. So you mm -hmm. got to try to find something better than king. And back then, they didn't have empires as much. So there you go. Exactly. Tamar completed uh, these three main demands, but it, it really became a problem when the nobles demanded that she make a house of lords who would be in charge of making laws and appointing ministers. And they wanted to put a man named Arslan in as army commander. Uh, this really frustrated her because she's looking at this place of power that she just had, she was just co-ruling in, and it was kind of crumbling in front of her by the courts and the politics around her. And she's sort of weak at this point. I mean, Weak in the sense that once a queen or king first comes to power, they've always got to tread lightly, don't they? Absolutely. Her luck would change when an old church patriarch died kind of unexpectedly, and he was replaced by a more timid figurehead uh, who would be less into trying to influence Tamar and less into um, trying to take over her power. Yeah, and the church patriarchs back then in the orthodoxy, I mean, that was kind of like the pope to the, uh, to the orthodox in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So she took this opportunity to kind of gain some ground back. She started spoiling her loyalists with amazing gifts and throughout time would replace nobles to make a more supportive crowd around her, uh, people who could stand up for her in the courts. Okay, so she's starting to consolidate a little bit of power. She's got this old patriarch out of the way. So at least that piece of power is out, but she still has to deal with the nobles, right? Exactly. So she's replaced a few of them, but she knew that she needed to get an army commander in who would really support her. 
So she um, added her own army commander from her own choices, and she appointed new finance and internal affairs ministers, which is important because when you control, you know, the finance and what goes on within your country, that's how you control your power again. She took back power without a battlefield. She also played the Game of Thrones, the game throughout the courts where you find people who you can trust. Yeah, the controlling the bureaucracy is one of those themes that you find a lot of war queens uh, playing into. They, they clean house once they get in. In Tamar's case, she started off with her father's men. She got new men pushed on her. But in time, she was able to replace those bureaucrats with other ministers who were going to be more loyal to her. And that's the basis of power for her kingdom going forward. The final straw for the courts, for the wolves that Tamar did, though, was arresting Arslan, the general that had been previously appointed by the courts. She had him arrested on grounds that, you know, he was trying to influence her too much or trying to diminish her father's legacy. And that, of course, outraged the nobles uh, who were trying to take back that power. They threatened to attack her palace. She had two wise women go and fake a negotiation with them. Um, all the while, she was marching her army towards the capital to strike down any dissenters. Um, and she was successful. That's a pretty well-used tactic, buying time by negotiating with your emissaries, these two women, mm -hmm. while she's you know, gathering enough troops that she can go back and take back Tbilisi. Exactly. And Tamar was known for someone who wasn't the hot-blooded charge into the battle at any type of dissent, at any type of conflict. She was known as someone who mm -hmm. would think things through and, and, you know, come forward with a more clever or more practical plan um, is one of the amazing qualities that we see throughout Tamar's life. She decided once she captured these dissenting nobles, the wolves who had been nipping at her feet, which actually included her aunt, who was very meddling throughout her life, she wanted to be merciful towards them. And this is actually something her father probably would not have done. So she ditched the ruthless approach of her father and her grandfather as well, and she pardoned the rebel lords, kind of solidifying her legacy as merciful and pious. You know, I, okay, I got to speak up here in defense of eye gouging in medieval times. One of the things that, w uh, that I remember reading from another source talking, uh, a secondary source in this case, was that back in those days, they didn't have prisons where you could just go for 20 years or something. They had jails where they'd keep you till you got tried, but for uh, prisons, they didn't have them. So your choice was basically, if you got convicted and you're just a burglar, they chop your head off. So, you know, I, I think around this time period, they settled on a punishment of gouging people's eyes out so they were blind and they couldn't go rob anybody else. And then they'd send them back to their village. And I'm not sure whether you'd rather lose your eyesight or just say, go ahead, chop my head off. But that was kind of the way they looked at it back in this very brutal part of the world at a very brutal time. Definitely. So that's my defensive eye gouge. <laughs> Great. Well, that's an eye-opening story. We'll hear more about Tamar's military career when we come back after the break. Tamar would spend the next few years on the road with her husband, Yuri. They would be going on military campaigns to gain back some of their territory. He was actually pretty good with some of the tactical decisions, and she learned a lot from him during this time. Still not great husband material, though? No, no, okay. definitely not. <laughs> he right. did not grow in that sense. But where she really performed well was the logistics. She definitely took care of most of the money management and making sure the army was equipped, which talking about all these different war queens, we know that's that's one of the most important jobs when you're going to war. They, you know, they say, if you don't have money, you don't have soldiers. If you don't have soldiers, you don't have money. Right. And, and we think of sometimes, you know, the cinematic moment where some guy like Napoleon points to a spot on a map and says, we march here. And it, things just don't happen that way, that you've got to have a lot of prior planning. And uh, Tamar was one of those women who didn't know much about battlefield tactics, but she did know how to maintain an army in the field and be their cheerleader. So that was a pretty good role for her and a good partnership between her and nasty, brutish husband. 
Absolutely. And they were actually, as a team together, um, probably more successful than their marriage, but they were mm -hmm. a good partnership on the battlefield. They marched through Armenia, taking over a lot of territory that was once owned by the ancient Scythians, Parthians, and even the Masajitai. Sorry to Tamiris, who we'll talk about later. Back at home, though, it was still an issue that Yuri was not a great husband. He was more prone to worshipping wine and sex and his sadistic tendencies. He was constantly drunk and had a long list of mistresses and was embarrassing Tamar, who was known for her virtue. And I mean, th this, a, a word about sources, because we, we love our old sources and mm -hmm. we're, we're not talking about secondary stuff, stuff written hundreds of years later. I mean, we're talking about chroniclers. There's some like, uh, like Shoto Rostavelli, the, the great Georgian poet who wrote around that time, a little bit later. Um, so, so these are guys at the time who are sort of appalled, even in that medieval, you know, kind of rough and tumble environment. They all said, dude, you're out of bounds. Definitely. And I mean, Yuri didn't just stop by, you know, punishing and maiming servants. He was doing it to other nobles as well. And it was becoming a very big problem. So about three years into their marriage, uh, Tamar pleads for an annulment, which I didn't know you could get an annulment three years in, actually. <laughs> you but... know, they hadn't had any kids, I guess. But, you know, look, the queen is going to be able to tell the clergy, we got to have this done. And I suspect mm -hmm. the clergy agreed with her. They just had to go back and look through the books and find some loophole. They would. And, and of course, Tamar couldn't be divorced because you're not supposed to get divorced in the Orthodox Church. So they did grant her that um, annulment. And they sent Yuri packing down to Constantinople with plenty of gold and lots of well wishes. Okay, so we got a good settlement out of the divorce. Definitely. <laughs> Going forward, Tamar would refuse a lot of marriage proposals after that. She had plenty of bachelors coming who maybe they admired her beauty and piety, but definitely admired her wealth and armies but she would want to focus on her kingdom and philanthropy, really giving back to the people, and she made it very clear that she was not interested in marrying again. Although, love uh, always seems to find a way back to some of our war queens, she eventually falls for the prince of Ossetia, David Soslan. Uh, she was a little bit related to him, though, a little gross, but like a lot of history, we just ignore that part. Probably distant relative, though. Yes. Hopefully far enough that they weren't, like... <laughs> you know, at, at family, you know, reunions too often together. <laughs> Definitely. Like, I bet she said, I know you from somewhere. It's yeah. so strange. <laughs> Great pickup line. Anyway, so in 1189, they married and they would go on to have several children. She gets rid of nasty Yuri. Mm -hmm. She's now got David. I wouldn't say she got rid of Yuri, though, because oh. Yuri would actually raise an army with the Sultan of Jerusalem, which was a kingdom in eastern Georgia. And he captured one of Tamar's royal palaces. So ex-husband's now coming back to redo the divorce deal. He is. He's definitely angry. He said, hey, I was on top. I'd like to get back there again, please. Tamar tried her old trick again of using some negotiators to buy her some time, but the rebels sent diversionary troops east while their main force marched south, burning absolutely everything in their way, kind of scorch earth method. She probably knew from working with Yuri that he might try something like this. So she divided her forces to meet the threats and she sent her husband to go deal with Yuri. The two armies would go on to clash at the river in this huge battle and Tamara emerged the decisive leader and the decisive ruler of her heartland. Surely that campaign was the war of husband versus ex-husband. Yuri's supporters would eventually lose their nerve and betray him, giving him up. Tamar would once again prove to be merciful on Yuri, although I don't know if I would have been so nice. She decided to just strip him of everything but his clothes on his back and his skin and send him back to Constantinople. So now Yuri's gone back to Constantinople a second time in disgrace, this time without a big trunk full of gold. Exactly. He was very angry because he would actually later on try again a third time. And she was merciful again. I give her so many points for that. It's very difficult to be kind to someone who's betrayed you several times, but... And, and run armies against her. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I think, does he qualify as history's most annoying ex-husband? I think he probably does. He He's got to be in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Later on, she would send him to a monastery to be kept under lock and key so he wouldn't be a thorn in her side again. But would really annoy the monks. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they probably yelled at him even if they had a vow of silence.
Tamar eventually has a son named Giorgi, and the custom when you have a son is that the husband or the king would conquer territory in the new son's name. That's what we do in suburban Atlanta. Really? Yeah. Really? What did you conquer? Uh, nothing. Uh, part of the cul-de-sac. Oh, okay. Great. O only for a few minutes. <laughs> The then, the, then the lady across the street told me to get out of the cul-de-sac. <laughs> okay, great. The issue with that is that you don't want to make anybody mad when you do this. As we mentioned before, they had a lot of tentative peace with the neighbors and a lot of conflicts as well. It's very difficult to take territory without starting an entire war. So they had to be pretty smart about it. Tamar's husband raised a small army that went to go conquer some territories to the west. The issue with that is they were unable to avoid making anyone mad. The Caliph of Baghdad ordered that every Muslim ruler wage jihad on Georgia, so they were pretty unsuccessful in avoiding that conflict. Well, and one thing to remember is uh, to a lot of Tamar's story is Orthodox Christians versus Muslims, but that kind of paints a very broad picture because, mm -hmm. as we've talked about in, in other contexts, you can't just take a religion or race or anything else and just use that to broad brush everybody. Groups within the Muslim religion, groups within the Orthodox religion, were all going to have their own political viewpoints and their, their own agendas. And a lot of them were willing to side against their co-religionists. So Tamar is sort of in a mixing pot of Muslim and, and Russian and, and just different types of cultures. And that's part of why there were so many wars in the Caucasus region. It was definitely a very difficult place to live um, and a difficult place to grow your kingdom and to keep your people happy with so many um, neighbors to the side itching to go to war. So she's going off to celebrate the birth of her kid by kind of running armies through these little kingdoms. She's now hacked off the Caliph of Baghdad. He goes jihad on her, and, and not in a metaphorical sense, but literally says, this is what we're going to do. So what happens next? Well, it's 1195, and the queen assembles her force of about 30,000 men and joins her armies along the southern border. This is where we get a bit of a cinematic movie moment where she gives the great kind of Braveheart speech to her people. I do love those cinematic moments. After the break, we'll talk about Tamar's next battle. So she wants to come across as strong and powerful, but she also wants to fill them with a lot of religious gusto. So she walks as a barefoot penitent across the battlefield and, and shouting prayers to her people, giving a very powerful speech. She would pray to the Virgin for the safety of her family and her people as the battle played out. And she walked to the church to kind of inspire them that God was with them, that they were not forsaken which I think is a beautiful thing to make people feel comforted. Uh, we were recently talking on a panel at the Alpharetta Library, and someone asked, Emily, who who would you want to be your ruler if you were a soldier? Mm -hmm. And I mentioned Tamar because I think she took great care to make her soldiers feel like she cared, like she was excited to be with them, excited to pray for them. And I think that's very comforting. Well, and throughout the centuries— Everybody likes to say God is on our side. I think the Germans even put it on their belt buckles in the First World War. But Tamar seemed to have more credibility because she had a reputation for piety and giving stuff to the poor and, and knitting sweaters for the poor, whatever it is they do back in, in you know churches back then in 12th century Georgia. And it would prove that she really did inspire her people. The Georgians pushed the invaders out of their land and pursued them east and even gained that territory that she was hoping to give to her new son, Georgie. It was a great win for the battle. It wouldn't end her conflict, but she assigned the great families of Georgia to protect that territory, which was really smart because you got to make sure people you trust are protecting those areas that are, you know, that they could come back and reinvade. Yeah, you give those barons a piece of the pie, you cut them in, and okay, this is your territory, as long as you can defend it. And defend it she would. In the year 1200, the Sultan of Rum sent a message telling Tamar to rescind her tributes from the Muslim kingdoms, and he demanded that she hand over her country and convert to Islam, 
and if she did so, he would grant her the honor of being the Sultan of Rum's wife, or at I, least one of them. I knew a guy in college who was the Sultan of Rum. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, the alternative to that would be that he would conquer her anyway, and she would be taken into his harem. So not really an appetizing... That's not a promotion to go from King of Kings to harem member. She knew she had to think and think smart here. So she calls a council meeting and talks to her most trusted advisors. Another situation where a war queen is trusting her generals, trusting her politicians to help her come up with the best answer. And that wasn't to you know, spread the blame if it went poorly. She was known as someone who was meticulous and, and wanted to be intentional about her choices. And intentional is a pretty good word for her because mm -hmm. at this point, even though she sort of stumbled into war after little baby Georgie's uh, party, you know, conquests, she did seem to do everything with an eye towards stability and mm -hmm. making sure that the next piece of the kingdom was stable before we move on to going further south into the uh, Iranian lands. It was a difficult decision because the force they were going up against with the Sultan of Rum was a 150,000 man army. They only had about 80,000 to go up against them, which was still the largest Georgian force ever assembled. Mm -hmm. Again, a really cool thing. You know, most people wouldn't think that a woman would command the largest force that country had ever assembled, but cool fact. Both sides, though, relied heavily on mounted archers, mercenary knights, and a traditional infantry line which would wield sword and shield, along with a spear. So we're talking like typical medieval battle lines at this point. Exactly. So at least they were about evenly matched in terms of weaponry and tactics. Before the battle, Tamar did her thing and kind of was the hype man that her people needed. So once again, she invoked God's blessing. She rallied her men to encourage them. And she carried icons of the Orthodox Church and, and big banners to kind of hype them up even more. All of the soldiers hailed Tamar as their king. Interestingly, not her husband, but Tamar as their king. She was the bloodline who was continuous, but David, or David, mm -hmm. was kind of the top general, though. Exactly. So she goes into the monastery as her men charge into the battle. The Georgians were able to strike the Turks while the Turks were still in their tents. And at first, the enemy was able to fend off the assault, and they threw together kind of a hasty line of defense that, you know, won this part of the battle. But the Georgians followed their frontal attack with two flanking cavalry assaults on either side, kind of sandwiching the Turks in. Eventually, the Turks were just too pinched in and began to crumble, and any stragglers fleeing the battlefield were killed in pursuit. That's one thing that uh, sometimes we don't hear as much about. In these ancient battles particularly, Sometimes, of course, the numbers are inflated. You know, Julius Caesar wouldn't hesitate to say that his enemies were like 10 times more than they really were. But in a lot of these battles, the key is just to break the enemy line so that they start to run. And then when they run, your horsemen can come do the stabby, stabby stuff and uh, while they chase them down. And that's where most of the slaughtering starts. This would be Tamar's crowning battlefield victory that a lot of people kind of remember her for. But it wouldn't be her last. Over the next few decades, she would go on to fight Byzantine puppet kings, the Persians, more Turks, etc. And she overall had a very successful military career. Over that time, she secured the homeland, she developed commerce, she encouraged architecture, literature, science, and religion, and really just brought Georgia into a golden age. So she was kind of like the Queen Elizabeth of Georgia. You've got uh, epic poets like we mentioned, Rustavelli. Wrote, he writes this big uh, epic that students in that part of the world still read today called The Night in Panther Skin or The Night in Tiger Skin, depending on how you translate it. Uh, she created this stable kingdom that was a real player in the Caucasus area. And she would come to be known as the Lion of the Caucasus, as the protector and great ruler of the Caucasus. And she's really revered in the region. She would end up ruling the largest expanse Georgia would ever have. And, and, you know, just thinking about it again, she ruled the greatest force Georgia would ever have and ruled the greatest landmass Georgia would ever have. And, and that's just absolutely incredible. Chroniclers of the time said peasants would live like nobles. Nobles were like princes and princes were like kings. 
everyone was happy and doing well, and, and she was beloved by the people of the region. So they got a good thing going, uh, eventually cue in the Mongols. But for right now, this was a pretty sweet time to be in a country that made a lot of sweet wine. <laughs> Definitely. Which Just we're going like to have after we, have we here. finish here. Yep. So another way that Tamar got this title as Lion of the Caucasus, an old Georgian saying at the time was, we know a lion by its claws and Tamar by her deeds. Who wants to know her? Let him see the towns, fortresses, and regions, which once belonged to the sultans and were taken by her, the frontiers which she doubled in size compared to those she received on ascending the throne. That's a very long saying, in my opinion. (laughs) It is. It doesn't exactly, it's not very pithy, but it kind of conveys the thought. To wrap up her story, several years after the death of her husband, her main vizier, and her senior generals, she crowned her oldest son, Georgi, as her co-ruler, just like her father did. So she kind of passed the baton of, you can co-rule with your descendants and you can teach them and you can kind of show them how to go into this because we don't get a lot of apprenticeships um, in this type of political system. After that, for the most part, she kind of just took a back seat to the military campaigns and stood alongside her son. And in 1213, she died at 52 years old, just from an illness. Well, she had uh, not only a good run, but knew when to back off and let the next generation take over, because 52 is pretty old for medieval standards. Yeah. Not old by modern standards, because that would make me old. But I'd be having a midlife crisis. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. To sum up what Queen Tamar was all about, she was pious. She dealt with some very rough nobles that she had to get out of the way before she could begin really ruling her country. But when she got started and got some traction in the late 1100s, she really managed to rule intelligently and deliberately. And and the word you used earlier, intentional, seems to sum up a lot about her. Definitely. So, Emily, in the scheme of all the women war leaders throughout history, where do you rank Tamar? What kind of points do you give her? I would have to actually give her probably the highest rankings I would give any queen in our book. Wow. And that's a big deal. And I know that her story isn't as bloody and colorful as some of other war queen stories are in our book, but she has a great track record. Mm-hmm. She, she was Unbeaten successful. Record, yeah. Yeah. She has a 100% record. Um, and at the same time, she never lost her mercy and her compassion, which is very difficult to do. We get a lot of war queens who have a lot of trauma, have a lot of hard things they go through, have a lot of bad luck. And and they do poisonings and assassinations and executions and all that stuff. Yes. And she didn't kill her father or she didn't kill any family members as far as we know. I'd have to give her a nine out of 10. Only one point taken away because she didn't have the hand-to-hand battle skills that maybe some of our other war queens did. But I'd have to rank her definitely at the top of my list. Well, those are impressive marks for a medieval war queen. Often the true work of a war leader goes on behind the scenes, not on the battlefield. Tamar's legacy has lasted for centuries, and she's become an honored part of Georgian history. That's our story of Georgia's war queen, Tamar. Listen to other episodes of War Queens for more stories of women who brought their nations through the fires of war. questions for us about war queens if you're curious about something you heard on the show we'd love to hear from you please email us at warqueens at diversionaudio.com again that's warqueens at diversionaudio.com we'll try to answer your questions on a future episode find us on twitter facebook and instagram at war queens podcast war queens is a production of diversion audio Your hosts are John Jordan, Emily Jordan, and I'm Natalie Emmanuel. The show is written by John and Emily Jordan based on their book, The War Queens. Our supervising producer and sound designer is Mark Francis. With production assistance from Antonio Enriquez. Editorial direction from Jacob Bronstein and Scott Waxman. Our head of marketing is Erica Farmer. Our theme music is by Tyler Cash. Executive producers, Jacob Bronstein, Mark Francis, and Scott Waxman for Diversion Audio.